Hi, I'm here today. We're talking about conservation genetics and why it matters to management. So hopefully you've watched uh, module one and you have a really clear understanding of the different types of principles around population genetics. So a quick summary of what Paul Sonnex presented uh, in looking at different molecular marker types is that when we talk about genetics, we're talking about the study of specific regions of the genome or functional genes or neutral genes. And you can either use microsatellites or otherwise known as short tandem repeats or single nucleotide polymorphisms, which we tend to call SNPs, which is basically one base pair uh, in different portions along the genome. When we talk about genomics, however, we're really talking about the study of the entire genome. So that's three uh, gigabases for most mammal species or three billion base pairs. Uh, however, unfortunately, geneticists tend to use the word genetics and genomics interchangeably, but they do actually have two different meanings. Now, when we talk about microsatellites versus SNPs, of course, as uh, Paul would have pointed out, microsatellite markers are generally are very short tandem repeats where there's different length of the repeat enables differentiation between individuals. Uh, these are very difficult, can be quite difficult to develop and don't actually occur very often throughout the genome. So we get these little points of differences uh, across the genome and they're not really representative of genome-wide diversity. The other type of molecular marker, of course, are SNPs, uh, and those are the single individual base pairs, which can be found along uh, the genome, and these are generally developed in uh, the tens of thousands of markers or thousands of markers. These can be really informative about genome-wide diversity. However, yet again, they don't fully represent um, all the diversity across the whole genome, but proportions of it. And the way the current methods are, are used for SNPs and SNP development, they tend to be biased more towards the neutral portions of the genome. Whole genome sequencing, on the other hand, is exactly what it sounds. It's sequencing the whole genome itself and allows us to look at a range of different factors, including uh, past demographic histories and diversity changes and inbreeding. We can look at the present gene flow and genetic diversity and inbreeding uh, within populations and different population sizes and use that information to predict the adaptive potential at functional gene regions. And when we use whole genome sequencing data, we tend to use about 50 million SNPs uh, in those data sets. Now, as I said in the introduction to the Threatened Species Training course, managers know that genetic diversity is important and that there's an inverse relationship between inbreeding and genetic diversity. And it's required to maintain adaptive potential for future change, as well as individual fitness. And this is why uh, genetic diversity within populations of wild and domesticated species has been categorised as a goal for the 2050 criteria under the Convention for Biological Diversity. Now, when we look at genetics and conservation management in Australia, things are definitely improving. But when we first started the Threatened Species Initiative and investigating what was going on in 2018, 2019, when we looked at the 200 national vertebrate recovery plans, it was only considered a nice to have. So of the 200 plans, more than 80% of them had some form of genetic action for the recovery of the species. However, less than 15% were in fact using genetic data. Now there's lots of conversations in the literature about using genetics or genomics in conservation management. Uh, you can see that we have been biobanking for a long period of time, uh, seed banks in particular, but more recently gametes and other tissues for, for wildlife species. We've also been using genetic management in captive breeding programs to understand pedigree-based management, and this will be used uh, moving forward to better inform uh, genetic load and reproductive technology. And there's also a range of different genetic rescue events that have occurred in Australia and genetics that have been used to inform different translocation events. It's also been used to facilitate adaptation, particularly in the gene editing space with coral species in order to be able to adapt to climate change and also the eradication of invasive species using dream drive in mosquitoes. And it has been uh, potentially listed as something that could be used for the de-extinction or cloning of species. Now, if we look at the National Threatened Species Action Plan that was published in 2022, that goes to 2032, there's a range of different activities in that plan. There's more than 15 targets that require some form of genetic data in order to undertake uh, those actions. And these include things such as species identification and taxonomy. Are you using the same or different species requiring the action? It's about priority action tracking, uh, actions improving species outcomes, restoring and improving habitat. Is the habitat resilient to climate change? 
and the impact of climate change on the priority species listed in the Threatened Species Action Plan and how these species are going to be resi resilient and be able to have their adaptive capacity to survive into the future. Genetics can also be used to assess biosecurity risks, particularly around measuring and establishing of new exotic species and also the management of the safe havens and the appropriate amount of genetic diversity that is being uh, put into those safe havens in the first place to ensure the long-term survival and viability of those populations. So if we look at genetics and conservation management, there's a suite of different questions that genetics can be used to inform how you make your decisions around population diversity and inbreeding, the adaptive potential of the species, particularly in a changing climate, Differences or commonalities between your source and your receiving populations if you're undertaking translocations, whether or not the founder uh, founders that you're putting into a safe haven or as part of a translocation event are potentially related to each other, can also be used to manage genetic diversity in both your ex situ populations and your safe haven populations and better inform and understand any potential reproductive skews that may be occurring if you're looking after wildlife species or understanding clonality and hybridization if you're looking at plants. So when we look at genetics and conservation management, some of your key questions are, are your two populations genetically different or are they connected or remain um, connected in a fragmented landscape? Are they the same species that you're investigating? Are they potentially hybrids of each other or are they different species altogether? And should you be managing them as separate species units? Should they be mixed or should they be kept separate? So as you would have learned through module one of this training course, there's no one magic genetic number or metric that we use to measure genetic diversity in conservation management, but it's understanding heterozygosity, your expected and observed amount of genetic diversity. You need to look at, have a measure of inbreeding at either the population or the individual level, understanding allelic richness or the amount of genetic variation you have within your population. What is your population's effective population size? relatedness or mean kinship um, and note that this is really a relative metric which is about uh, where you sampled your individuals um, if you have sampled a family group or sampled widely across the range and genetic differentiation of the populations or an FST or PCOA plot and so really what you want to know is do does genetic data exist for your population of interest before you even start so to help you with this we've developed the uh, um, Australian reference genome atlas or AGA, and what you can do, uh, this is a collaborative project between the Australian Biocommons, Atlas of Living Australia and Bioplatforms, co-funded by the AIDC. And you can go in and either select uh, looking at genomes itself, or you can click on uh, type in your different organism. Uh, the different numbers of genomes can come up and you can browse the genomes if you're not quite sure uh, the exact scientific name or name of your organism. You can go into your uh, the organism that you're particularly interested. It will give you a distribution of that area, and it will actually give you information around where you can find genetic data. So let's say we click on the whole genome tab, and this will tell us where the reference genome sequence exists and how you can potentially download that information and use it for uh, investigating the species of concern. And one of the main reasons we want to know whether genetic data exists is because you want to be able to investigate what the genetic differences are between your different populations and potentially if you want to mix them. And this is probably one of the most key questions we get asked in conservation management and whether or not you should be using genetic data. So you can have two populations which are genetically different from, one, from each other but are quite inbred within themselves. But if you mix them, you can end up with more genetic diversity and lower inbreeding across those populations populations. So where we've seen some classic examples of genetic eggs mixture, of course, is the mountain pygmy possum and the big horned sheep, where we saw a significantly increased uh, numbers of, uh, female, of, of females breeding and a greater number of increase of genetic diversity in the offspring that are being produced. Other types of genetic egg mixture are a little bit more subtle, uh, where we saw things with the burrowing betong as well as the western barred bandicoots, where we had two separate inbred populations that were mixed, and we resulted in populations with more genetic diversity than the, than the inbred founding populations, or even more subtle again, some of the genetic rescue events we've seen in Tasmanian devils. So if we look at something like the mountain pygmy possum, you can really get an obvious fitness benefit by mixing the populations where you have more offspring per female. We had increased body weight of offspring as well as the adults and improved survival of the offspring. 
or you can have a little bit more subtle uh, in some of the genetic benefits where you can confer a fitness benefit, but it's not that obvious to see. Or with Tasmanian devils, when we mix two populations, we improved allelic variation of critically important genes, which of course were the MHC or immune genes for Tasmanian devils and improved resilience to different diseases um, such as pathogens and external parasites. But one of the key things you need to know before you start mixing your populations is how long have the populations been separated? Have there been signs of historical gene flows? And critically important, are there chromosomal differences potentially uh, between the populations if they've been separated for a long period of time? There's also a number of applications and challenges uh, that you need to be aware of when you're thinking about using genetics and conservation management. You need to have a baseline of genetic data. Uh, this requires samples to be stored, uh, collected and stored correctly. Samples need to be sequenced using the same technologies and technologies that can be aligned to one another. So historically what's happened sometimes is different technologies have been used such as DART-seq or DDRAD. And if we end up in that situation, the data sets become incompatible. So one of the key things you need to do when you start to consider using genetics for your species is to try and investigate using Argo about what kind of genetic data has already been generated for your species and potentially then go and use the same sequencing method. Is the data searchable and retrievable across time and space? This is critically important if you want to investigate uh, different um, whether or not your the genetic diversity is increasing or decreasing in your species, and is the data stored in a national data repository to permit access across other jurisdictions. So something that you need to re recognize is that not all sequencing is created equal and things to consider is cost versus coverage. So the higher the coverage or the more parts of the genome that you want to sequence, the cost will be higher. Data storage and transfer and compute can also add to your costs and also have a think about the future kinds of questions you may want to ask for the species that you're trying to manage. And really what it fundamentally comes down to is what are your biological and management questions, as these will inform the different types of methods that you choose to use in your genetic management. So globally, there's some global indicators to assess uh, and approximate um, genetic diversity status without requiring new uh, DNA data. And this is a very uh, exciting paper produced, uh, produced by Sean Hoban and colleagues that's uh, publicly available, open access through conservation letters. And what they talk about is three different indicators, where indicator one is looking at the proportion of populations within species with a genetically effective population size of greater of 500 individuals. So that equates to a census population size of approximately 5,000 individuals. Indicator two is the proportion of populations maintained within species. So not only that each population has a census size of more than 5,000 individuals, but that there's a number of populations across the species range and that each population may hold unique traits and adaptations. And indicator three is the number of species and populations monitored using DNA methods. And DNA monitoring when available can, uh, can guide conservation actions and policy. So what Sean has uh, and team have shown is that you can use data from different sources to uh, investigate your species, available data sources, and then how you can combine both genetic information as well as demographic and geographic information to be able to facilitate um, the indicators, the three different indicators to better understand um, what's happening with the genetic diversity of your species as well uh, in the policy setting and how you can use that to plan your man management interventions. So a lot of information is included in this course, and I tried to do a, a short synopsis for you today, but really the age of genomics is here, and biodiversity is underpinned by three pillars, diversity of ecosystems, diversity of species, and diversity of genes. And you need to have an understanding of all three of these pillars in order to maintain biodiversity in the longer term. So genomics really provides a powerful tool to enhance our understanding of global earth biodiversity and it has a wide range of applications for policy, ecology, translocations, evolutionary biology and law. And hopefully we're helping improve your understanding of genetic literacy through this training course. So as one of my colleagues once said to me when I asked them why it's been so important to have genetic data as part of their uh, conservation management actions, and they said having genetic data available for management of a threatened species is the difference between flying blind or flying with a navigation system. 
So we hope you continue to enjoy the Genomics Online course and we'll keep updating and changing uh, the different course material as technology changes into the future. So again, thank you uh, very much acknowledgement to all the TSI contributors and organisations that have supported the project over the years. Thank you very much.